G'day everyone, here's a video I put together that explains the process that I use to paint the weathered bronze armor on this Chaos Warrior. I primed the mini black using Steinal Res airbrush primer, although a rattle can would work just as well. Um, for the first few coats, I'm using Mornfrang Brown from GW, as it has a nice orange tone to it that will work for the effect I'm looking for. You can see on the palette how I've thinned it, it's about 60-40 water to paint. The first coat is just going to cover all the armor plates, uh, I'm using a size 2 synthetic brush and I'm not really trying to get a smooth even coat. Instead the paint is applied using a rough scratchy motion and some inconsistency in the application will help with the final product. In order to keep the video length down, I've focused only on a few parts of the model that will show the process. That's the head, the left leg, and the shield. All the techniques apply everywhere else though, and they were all painted in the same way. You can see how the paint goes on, and it's very vibrant, but as it dries it dulls down quite a lot, and in some places it looks almost black. Uh, this is going to set the shadow color for the finished product. You can see where I apply the first coat to the shield, just how rough I'm being with the paint and it gives a look at how the paint really dulls down as it dries and just how quickly it dries because it's so thin. For this mini I've chosen to have the light source be coming from in front and slightly up to the left so all the highlights I apply will have this in mind so that they're all consistent. There's a few ways you can work out where to place the highlights. You can hold the model under a lamp at the angle you want, maybe take a photo for reference. For this mini, I just hold it so that I'm looking at it from the correct angle, and then I choose the plates I can see to highlight. With the first coat applied to all the armor plates, I can start the process of building up the color from the very dark brown it is now towards a more saturated tone. I'm using the same paint and the same brush, and I just start to work over the plates again. At this stage I want to begin accentuating the areas where the light would be hitting. That means that parts facing directly away from the light will only get a little, if any, of this paint. You can see on the knee pad how I only paint the top and left facing surfaces, and on the shield I leave a patch on the bottom that's just the base coat, and the right side of the shield is almost completely untouched with this layer. The real trick to an effective NMM is a big transition in brightness, so in order to match the future highlights, I also need to have very dark areas. I'm still not being super precise with my painting here, although I do take a little more effort to ensure I'm not getting paint where I want it to remain really dark. So you can already see with just this second coat uh, how the color and brightness have already built up over the previous layer, particularly towards the top of the shield, and it's already giving a really nice transition. It's important at this point that you make the layer pretty large, as if you make it too small, you won't leave enough space for future layers of brighter colors. It'll vary for each model, but here I covered about 75% of the surface with this second layer. Really depends on the final look you're going for though, so you can experiment with different sized highlight areas. Something that will become more apparent later is that not everything needs to be highlighted the same amount, and really you want to have brighter and darker areas around the model to help draw the eye where you want. Usually this means making things brighter towards the head. Once I'm happy with the Mornfang brown coat, it's time to start the progression towards higher values. So this will be done over a few colors, and the first one of them is XV88 from GW. I've thinned this out about the same as the Mornfang brown, but it's really more of an art than a science. As long as the paint is thin enough that it will dry with some transparency, then it should be good. At the same time, you don't want it so thin that it'll take lots of layers to build up some color. The amount of water you need is going to vary depending on the paint you're using, and even the same paint in different pots will vary. The more you paint and spend time mixing, the better a feel for it you'll get. At this point though, I try to be more on the thin side of things, since you can always add more paint, but you can't take it away. For this color, I've switched to a smaller brush, just so I can have a little bit more control over the paint. I'm still looking to make texture marks on the mini, but now I'm using more of the point of the brush, making little dots and lines across the surface. At this layer, I also start to pick out the edges that I want to highlight. Uh, the way I like to edge highlight is only on actual edges. Unlike the GW Studio style 
where they'll pick out every edge. I only really ever want to edge highlight if I can hit it with the side of my brush. That means it's really only hard edges on metal plates and other similar surfaces that will end up with an actual edge highlight. Other areas may end up looking like it, but that's a byproduct rather than anything intentional. As with the previous layer, I'm again looking to work the paint up towards where the highlights will be. However, one of the tricks you can use to make metal look beaten and weathered is to put a few small dots and scratches of your brighter color overlapping into the darker areas. You don't want to do a lot of them, but a few well-placed ones will look like dings and scratches that are catching the light. You see me do this in a few places around the knee armor and in the darker areas of the shield. These Chaos Warrior models also have a fair amount of sculpted on scratches and dents, so I treat them in the same way. You can see on the top of the shield there's a row of dents, so I highlight around them towards the right side that would catch the light coming from the left. I like the Mornfang Brown where there were two clear coats. Moving forward it's a process of applying some paint and then moving around the figure, going backwards and forwards between them until you find a look that you're happy with. There's probably three coats of paint on any of the plates by the time I'm done with the XV88, just not one after the other. This allows the colour to build up in the areas where there is more paint and it gives a continued transition from dark to light even though I'm not blending in the traditional sense. In order to not have the video be two hours long, I've also cut out a lot of the footage that's just me turning the model around, looking at it from different directions to make sure I'm putting highlights in the right place, and also just to make sure I'm not missing anything that I should be painting at this stage. You can always come back later and tidy it up if you need to, but spending a little extra time at each step to make sure you've finished saves time later on. So when applying highlights, it's important to consider the shape of the piece that you're painting. Different shapes have different volumes of light, and you need to get that part right in order to maximize the effect. The inside of the forearm is a cylinder, and that will have a different shaped highlight to the top of the helmet that's a sphere. The top of the shield is also a sphere, just a much larger one, and that influences where I choose to put the focal highlight point. There's a lot of really good videos on YouTube that go into detail about how it's done, don't just constrain yourself to miniature painters either, there's a wealth of really great info in traditional art that crosses over. One of the things you should notice is that there are certain plates that I work on more than others. Everything on the left side of the miniature gets more of each progressively lighter colour, and different parts stop getting paint after a certain point. The most obvious example of this is on the shield, where the top left is going to get all the highlight colours, whereas the right hand side of the shield is going to stay mostly just Mornfang brown. One of the traps that people fall into with NMM is making everything the same brightness across the model, and that ends up just making it look flat. Just like you need contrast uh, across individual elements, you also need it across the model as a whole. So after I was done with the XV88, I thinned down some of the Mornfang brown even more, and I applied it as a glaze over the transition point between the two colors. I'm not actually sure this step was really needed, and I wouldn't do it on rank and file models. One effect it does have though is it helps to make the scratches and dots look like they're part of the model rather than just sitting on top of it. The XV88 is now done and I move on to the next colour. This is Baylor Brown from GW. It's a lighter brown with a yellowish tone to it. You can see on the palette how I thinned it and also how I test that it's thin enough by seeing how it runs into the creases on my hand. You could do the same thing by touching it to some paper towel and looking how it spreads out. It doesn't really matter how you check, but it's helpful to find something consistent that you can refer to. This stage of painting isn't much different to the previous one. I'm using the same size brush here, and again I'm working around the model, applying the paint in the same stippled process. As I go, I also pick out some of those areas in the shadowed space just to reinforce them a bit. I still want to keep them pretty small and reserved, but they do add a lot to the final result. While I'm applying the Baylor Brown, this is the point where I really want to start to only work on the parts that will be directly in the light. So really working on the parts of the model that are facing left, and also starting to put more focus up towards the head of the model. So I'm creating a transition from dark to light starting at the bottom right and working up towards the top left. It's also at this stage that you can really see the dark directly next to light that helps with the NMM effect and makes it work. 
It's especially visible on the knee guard, where the left side builds up to the midline, and then it's much darker on the other side. When the final highlights get added, this will cause it to have the pop that it needs. I continue to build up the edge highlights using a combination of strokes and tapping on the edges to give it a rough, uneven feel that'll contribute to the overall weathered effect. As I go up in colours, I'm only highlighting portions of the edges, the same as I do with the plates themselves. Having the edge highlight extend into the darker areas a little way, though, helps to provide some definition to the shapes. Something I particularly like about this more textured style of painting is that it takes away the mental worry about how smooth everything has to be. The visual noise that's created by the textures along with the thin transparent paint creates what I think is a more natural looking finish. As I'm getting up towards the final highlights, the amount of surface I work on has been shrunk pretty dramatically, and the next layers of highlight after this will only be applied in very small sections on each plate. To get a real shiny finish, the highlights need to be very constrained, as if they're too big the effect will be lost. This is probably the hardest part of the NMM process to get right, and it took me quite a long time to figure out, but once you get it once, it becomes much easier to repeat. Something else I think is interesting about painting NMM, at least for me, is it seems much easier to do in gold and other colours than it is to do silvers and steels. I think it was because when I first started trying to do it, I was focused too much on how smooth my transitions were and not on where the transitions should be. And this resulted in everything being very flat with highlights that were too large. And I used too much white and that kind of ruined the finish effect. When picking out edges on sculpted on detail, like the two big gouges in the shield, it's usually best to highlight the bottom edge of the cut as the light is coming from above and it would be the lip that catches the light. Uh, I actually messed this up here and highlighted the top edge. I also made the highlights too big, so it looks pretty unconvincing to me. Um, I'll probably go back and tidy that up before I finish the model. I'm also not really happy with the section that is highlighted towards the bottom of the shield as it doesn't look right to my eyes, but this might just be because it's next to an area that is going to be pretty bright, but it's black right now. In some cases, you just have to let it sit until there's more paint on the model, and I can always come back and tidy it up later. It's one of the other benefits of this kind of painting, is that I'm only using a few colours, and there's not a lot of mixing involved, so it's very easy to come back to any part that I'm not happy with and go over it. Even in a worst case scenario, I can just repaint a section with the black primer and build up again pretty quickly. Even so, I usually wait until I've added some more colour to the model before I make any dramatic changes, as something that seems really glaring right now might end up looking fine once more of the miniature's been painted. You can see here how I've taken the Baylor Brown and I've mixed it about 50-50 with some XV88 and added some more water to make it a glaze. And you should be able to see just how much thinner it is there on the palette. But you can also see me test it out on my hand and the kind of consistency I'm looking for. With this glaze, it goes over most of the previous colors. It's so thin that it doesn't really impact very much and you have to build it up over a few layers. Again, I'm not really sure if this is needed. Um, I'd only do it on character models and I wouldn't worry about it for regular troops. One of the challenges for me with these kind of paint jobs is that for most of the model, it doesn't really look good. It's mostly just brown and not at all metallic looking, but this is just the groundwork that's needed for the next step, which is where it all comes together and starts to look like a finished product. Resisting the urge to just scrap the whole thing was something that took me a while to learn. Now I'm getting to the business end of things. Uh, for the next color, I'm taking a tonal jump up much closer to white. This is Ice Yellow from Vallejo, um, and I love this color. I use it on almost every model I paint, particularly for NMM work, but it's also just a really good highlight color. It's thinned about the same as the previous paints, and it will be applied in the same method but as this is the real highlight color, it's going to be used a lot more sparingly. I've gone to an even smaller brush now. This one is a double zero, as I want to be precise with where I'm applying the paint to the miniature. I take a fair amount of time at this stage and I really think about where I want the highlights to be. I start out quite small, as a little goes a long way here. Even just those few edges and spots on the knee already have a pretty pronounced effect and it's always easier to add a little paint at a time 
than it is to add too much and then have to go back and fix it. What I'm looking for here is pop, and you get that most with strong contrast. Small points of bright light in the dark areas really showcase that, but again, you have to do it sparingly to maximize the impact. Things like the little rivets on the armor plates help with it as well. The ice yellow is a dramatic tonal jump, and it's quite stark when it's wet. However, as it dries, it dulls down, and so it will take a couple of coats to get the kind of brightness needed for the effect, but it also means you can vary the brightness on different parts by applying more or less paint to them as you work around the mini. Really pick out sharp, hard edges, spikes and rivets here, and give them multiple coats to get them quite bright. There's a lot of methods and techniques to painting miniatures, um, and a lot of them can seem intimidating at first. NMM scares a lot of people because it seems difficult, but really it can be achieved using a few well-chosen colours, and it's mostly about where and how you place paint on the model. There's two types of skills here. Uh, the first is that portion of knowing where to put the paint, but the other is the mechanical skill of how you use the brush. This is going to be a pretty personal thing for everyone, but for me, I like to make sure that my elbows are resting on the armrests of my chair and my forearms are on the corner of the desk. This helps to make sure that there are as few moving parts as possible and I'm mostly just manipulating the brush with my fingers. If you can master brush control, then mechanically you can do any kind of painting. Painting this miniature while recording, uh, that was a real challenge, as having the figure be in the right spot for the camera forced me to hold it in positions that were pretty unnatural sometimes, and I have a newfound respect for the YouTubers who can do it so well. While I did try to record every stroke of paint, I will admit there's a few places where I had to pull the miniature out of the shot in order to get paint on it. Particularly around the head, which is the focal point of the model, and I wanted to make sure that it was correct and looks good. Hopefully I've included enough here that the process is understandable though. Something else you might notice if you take another look at the finished product in the picture at the start or the end of the video is that the highlights on the upper left part of the shield are different. After I finished the recording, I spent some time looking at the model and I decided that I'd made the highlights too small and they were the wrong shape. So the top of the shield is a sphere, so the highlight should be circular. But when I applied it first, it was more of a curved line, and I decided I didn't like how it looked. So I went back and repainted it to look more like what I was after. I point this out because one of the big steps for me as a painter was just accepting that things won't always go right. There was a long time where I was afraid to try things, because maybe I just wouldn't do them well. Like, what if I messed up the paint job? What if it looks terrible? Uh, finally, I realized that it's just paint. It's not permanent, and I can always just paint over it. Um, I painted some dwarf models that all told I probably stripped six or seven times, just trying to get a skin tone that I liked. Hopefully this video will encourage you to give this kind of painting a try, and if you mess it up, hopefully you still learn something, and then you can just try it again. So as the colors get closer to white, it can also get quite desaturated and lose a lot of the color. Uh, in order to bring some of it back and help to incorporate the ice yellow into the paint job, I made a glaze out of Baylor Brown and applied it over much of the surface. This just knocks back the brightness a little bit and tones it down a touch. Once the glaze is done, I go back in with the ice yellow and reinforce the areas that I want to be brighter. Unlike the other glazes where I wasn't really sure if they helped, this one is absolutely needed. Um, and one of the things you can do is repeat this process of glazing and highlighting multiple times and it will create a sheen effect. So if you were trying to get something very bright and shiny like gold, um, I didn't need that though here so I just did it once. For the second pass of the ice yellow, I also try to make the area covered just a little smaller. This helps the transition between it and the previous layer and also helps it to not be too stark. I'm not looking for perfectly smooth transitions, but at the same time, I don't want there to be really obvious gaps between the colors. I basically just put one color on top of the other, but depending on the level of finish, you could also add more layers between each color. Doing a 50-50 mix of each color will allow for even smoother transitions, but it also takes more time, and depending on the size of the surface, it might not even be visible. Certainly if you are trying to win a competition, you should spend that time, but I'm not trying to win any prizes, so cutting a few corners to save some time is fine. 
At this point, the armor is mostly done, and I could stop here and I'd be pretty happy with it. Um, I want to add a final level of punch to it, though, so I'm going to do a little more work. I didn't record it, but I put some Pro Acryl Bold Titanium White on the palette. This is already pretty fluid, uh, much more thin than the other paints I've used, so I didn't thin it at all, and I just used it straight out of the bottle. So when adding white highlights, less is more. So where the ice yellow was relatively a broad highlight over a relatively large part of the surface, the white is tiny. You can see that it's just a few dots right at the top of the highlight of the helmet and where two sharp edges come together on the leg armor plates. Used sparingly, it provides a real final level of pop to the effect and it gives a real shine look to it. If you overdo it though, the mini will end up looking washed out, so really think about it and just pick a couple of spots to accentuate the other work. And that's it, weathered bronze armor. You can swap the colors out for any other ones you like and get a similar effect. Give it a try, and remember, it's just paint. <laughs>